<clears throat> Good afternoon. <laughs> if you were expecting to hear a talk on Shinto shrines, Zen Buddhist priests, or how to make an etching, you should leave now. <laughs> so let's begin. Sunday, sweet Sunday, with nothing to do. Lazy and lovely, my one day with you. Sunday, sweet Sunday, on Sunday you'll see only me. And with that, welcome to the 65th anniversary of the Vern Collection. And to Sundays with Mike. <laughs> Live. Thank you to all the collectors and all my friends who have supported the gallery um, over the last 65 years. Thank you to all the artists that believed in a small gallery in Cleveland. And thank you to everyone that has worked here. Bob is here, um, who's helped me all over the country. Um, and all the, all the people that have worked here or volunteered here. And, and right now, I'd like to thank um, Yuko and Will, who are my current managers. <laughs> this is gonna be good. Why do I do Sundays with Mike? I do Sundays with Mike to capture that feeling of being a kid again. That feeling of running out the side door to your best friend's house. That feeling of telling stupid jokes and laughing until you can't breathe. That feeling, because I'm interested in sports, of getting the game-winning hit or kicking the winning winning goal. Or that simple feeling of licking an ice cream cone on a hot summer day with your family or friends. Where does Sunday, Sundays with Mike come from? When I was a little kid, there were only three channels on the TV. Three, five, and eight. And every Sunday before the cartoons, Sunday morning cartoons would come on, there would be these preachers of various religions. And they had thousands of followers. There were two main televangelists. One's, one guy was named Rex Humbard. <laughs> and uh, the other guy, all of a sudden I forgot his name. Um, his name was Ernest Angley. <laughs> and Ernest Angley could heal you. He would, he would go out into the audience and he would touch your forehead. And whatever was wrong with you, he'd, he'd fix. And the, the, the parishioner would fall backwards. And, and uh, about a year ago, I had this medical problem. And uh, I thought, uh, well, maybe it'll work. <laughs> and uh, so I, I tried it. And uh, three ambulances later, I decided I'd better get a doctor. But uh, at any rate, there were these two main evangelists. And I wasn't so fascinated with the subject matter, but I was, I was fascinated by how many people were listening to these guys. Um, they were very charismatic. There was a certain rhythm to the way they spoke. Their timing was perfect, and they gave people hope. And as these preachers worked their congregation into a frenzy. They did certain things at the end of their sermon. I only watched the end of the sermon because I didn't want to miss the cartoons. <laughs> and they did certain things at the, at the end of the sermon. They would uh, look up to the sky. They would raise their hands, just sort of like when a baseball player hits a home run. And remember this part, because otherwise you won't understand this whole talk. <laughs> So they would, they would look up to the sky, they'd, they'd spread their hands, 
They'd point at the crowd. Their wife was usually in a little pink or white dress standing in the corner with a little placard or a book they were trying to sell, like this Gloria Plevin book, $35. <laughs> and uh, at, at the end of the sermon, um, they would often look out into the crowd and they would wink. So about 20 years later, when I joined my mom in the gallery, I thought to myself, I'm going to try this. <laughs> but instead of telling people stories about religion, I would tell them the stories of the struggles and successes of my artists from Japan. I would tell them the stories of how I would tell them the stories of how a small gallery in Cleveland competed against some of the biggest galleries in the world, in the world of art and Japanese prints. For example, I would tell them the story of Daniel Kelly, who was born in Idaho Falls, Idaho, grew up in Great Falls, Montana. He goes to Japan almost 40 years ago, and a few days before he leaves from San Francisco, he has $1.95 in his pocket. And he can't afford the really expensive books on Japanese art, so he buys a small book by a Japanese printmaker named Tokoriki. Tokoriki studied with printmakers who studied with Hiroshige, who was the top landscape printmaker in the mid-19th century. In the back of this book, it said, if the reader of this book is in Kyoto, please visit the artist's studio. And it gave the address. And Daniel said, what the heck? He says, I'm going to go visit this guy. He became his pupil. His work is now in the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the British Museum, the Smithsonian, the Cleveland Museum, and about 20 other major art museums. This is an example of Daniel's work from his Japanese Lantern series. This is called Read All About It. I would tell them the story of Sarah Breyer, who was born in Rochester, New York, who's also been in Japan for about 40 years. She is the only Westerner allowed to work in the 800-year-old papermaking village of Aichizen. She is the first Western woman ever to get the cover of the catalog of the top contemporary Japanese print show in Tokyo. In the last five years, she's had numerous museum exhibitions and her works in the Smithsonian and the British Museum, to name a few. This is Sarah's handmade paper back here. This is called Layered Moonlight. I would tell them the story of Katsunori Hamanishi, who in 2012 had a show at the Smithsonian. In 2013, he had a show at the Art Institute of Chicago. And in 2014, this triptych of kimonos over here on the wall was featured at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's also in the Art Institute of Chicago collection, and I also believe it's in the Smithsonian collection. He's the son of a horseshoe maker. I would tell them the story of Yuko Kimura, born in Tokyo, a graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Art, and has a master's degree from the University of Michigan. Yuko came to my gallery about 25 years ago. She had just won the Agnes Gund Award. Agnes Gund's the lady who built the Museum of Modern Art. And she showed me the piece that, that won it and asked me to sell it. And I sold it in one day. But Yuko was so shy and modest and quiet, she didn't come back for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> She is now one of my leading artists. And when I show in New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco and the Cleveland Museum of Art Fine Print Fair that's coming up in a few weeks, Yuko's works are all just one of a kind works. They completely sell out. People think I'm making it up because I have a master's degree in marketing from Case, but, <laughs> but, but uh, they completely sell out. And after we, we finish the show and we 
uh, clean everything up and pack everything up to, to and there's nothing of Yukos to ever to pack up but but uh, we usually go out to dinner and I have a couple glasses of wine and we both start laughing and we say well you, you did it again <laughs> and uh, Yuko has two uh, big museum shows coming up in the next three years so. <laughs> Yuko Yuko where are you uh, that's Yuko hiding in the corner there. <laughs> Where are the shows? Uh, one is a smaller show at the Canton Akron Art Museum, and one is at uh, a traveling show that will travel to about five or six different major museums. It's, it's of all uh, many of the top Japanese paper makers. Um, Sarah Breyer should be in there too, but unfortunately she's, she's Western. <laughs> I wish I could tell you about all of my wonderful artists, but there's not time. Um, when I do these exhibitions all over the United States, I am the only one from Cleveland. And every show when I do these shows, people flock to my exhibition space. And I think of these preachers on Sunday and uh, and Um, my, guess, my guess is that the other galleries are thinking the same thing. They're thinking like, why are all these guys, why are all these people listening to this guy? And they're thinking the same thing that I th thought when I was a little kid. You know, why are all these people listening to these televangelists? I think my stories give people hope that if all these artists that shouldn't have, shouldn't have made it, shouldn't have made it this big and that a little gal gallery in Cleveland can make it, that they can too. It's pretty much the story of David versus Goliath. <laughs> the history of the collection, and this is going to be very brief because most of you know it. But my parents went to Japan in their early 30s. My dad was a lieutenant and doctor in the US Navy. And they took my sisters who were about six and three, Betsy and Heidi. They left me at home with a note with my aunt's phone number in case I had an emergency. <laughs> but no, I, I, I wasn't born until 1955. My mom, uh, was one of the first people after World War II to bring back fine Japanese prints and paintings to the, to the United States. And this all began as a private collection of old Japanese prints and paintings that were on loan to the Metropolitan Museum, some of which were on loan to the Metropolitan Museum, the, the Cleveland Museum, and the Fog at Harvard. My parents uh, didn't have much money. They strictly collected what they loved. And they were helped by a man named Mr. Tashiro, who owned a place called Kamakura Fine Arts. And they lived down the road from the summer palace of the emperor. My mother thought she was the emperor, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my history is a little bit different. I grew up uh, really good at sports. I had lots of friends. I'd go over to my friend's house to play and they all had pictures of cows and cowboys and pilgrims and ducks and, and uh, pictures of George Washington and pictures of, uh, of the Constitution framed and, and my friends would come over to my house and there were like Japanese scroll paintings, Japanese prints, Japanese ceramics and in the backyard was this big sculpture of this mischievous badger uh, named Tanuki and Tanuki as big balls. Uh, I have a master's degree from Case Western Reserve University in marketing. What I know from about Japanese art comes from my mom and dad and growing up with many of these special works surrounding me. Too much of the art world is about trends and hype and, and uh, the one thing my parents always taught me is that when you look at art you should always look with your eyes and your heart, whether it's expensive or inexpensive. The first two scrolls my parents ever collected were $15 each. Those were on loan to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. What I know about Japanese art is not something 
you can learn in a textbook is from living it. So that brings us to the more interesting part. Okay, so this is called Dealing with Fame, Michael Vern, World Famous Art Dealer. <laughs> People always ask me, Michael, how do you deal with such fame? And, and uh, I, I tell them it just comes naturally to my family. <laughs> I was a little, at a local sports bar the other day, and this guy comes up to me and he says, uh, he says I think I know you. And I politely said, yeah, I, I don't believe so. And uh, uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, who would know a world famous art dealer in a, in a local sports bar? And, uh, but the guy wouldn't go away. And he comes back, he says, he says, I, says I know who you are. And I, again, said, I, I don't believe so. But then I was starting to think, well, maybe I am amazing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, he, says, uh, he says, I know who you are. He says, uh, you're James Franco's uncle. <laughs> The funny thing is, is, except for a very few people, that said, the people that are here and that have supported the gallery, very few people know who I am in Cleveland. Thousands of people know who I am when I go to New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco and showing these shows. I can't remember their names, but they know me. And, uh, and a few people know me from coaching Little League Baseball for my kids. Um, they go, oh, you're the guy that coached my kids. But uh, there, there's, a, there's a reason that I've kept it pretty quiet. Um, my dad, my dad always told me to be modest and humble and quiet about your accomplishments. And it's something that I still believe in. It's a, it's a lost art, but it's something that I still believe in. So that's one of the reasons. Uh, when I meet new people in Cleveland, they, they usually ask me, well, what do you do? And I, I tell them I sell Japanese art, and they probably think, well, that's cool, and that's some weird guy. And, uh, and uh, then they, they usually say, well, where, where's the gallery located? And I tell them, well, it's, it's next to Valentino's Pizza. <laughs> and, uh, and they go, oh, I know that place. I love that place. <laughs> and uh, then they usually think, well, maybe he's only been open for a couple of years. And they say, well, how long you had the gallery? And I go, 65 years. And then they usually respond to a, I've never seen it. <laughs> Which brings us to the pep talk. I'm a pretty shy, quiet person, except when I do these, these talks. So each morning in the shower, I give myself a pep talk. And I get out of the shower completely naked. I look in the mirror. Luckily, it's a mirror above the sink, so you can only see this high. <laughs> and I do a few things. I go like this, and then I slap my thighs, okay. and I look in the mirror and I go, let's go Mike. And this goes way back to my interest in sports and the thrill of competition, which takes us to showing in New York. The top shows in New York are held at a place called the New York Armory at 67th and Park. Not a lot of these shows are being held there anymore, but that's where the top shows used to be held. About 30 years ago, I heard about a show called Works on Paper, which the New York Times said was the number one show of its kind in this country. And it was run by a guy named Sanford Smith. And um, only the top galleries in the world were in it. They were the biggest galleries. They were from New York and Paris and London and Munich. And I told my friends, I'm going to apply to this show. And... Uh, so I wrote a letter to this guy, Sanford Smith. I didn't claim to be the biggest Japanese print gallery in the world. I didn't claim to have the most Japanese prints. But I did claim to have maybe the best quality. And uh, this is around April of 1990. I wrote him. I didn't hear anything back. Around February of 1991, mid-February, about two weeks before the show is going to open, this guy calls up the gallery and he says, this is Sanford Smith. He says, do you want to be in the works on paper show? 
And I thought it was one of my friends joking around, and, and I started laughing. I said, who is this? And, uh, and uh, he said, this is Sanford Smith. So I said, well, yes, if this is really Sanford Smith, yes, I do. So I didn't have time to prepare for the show. I didn't have time to hire a shipper. And uh, I couldn't afford a shipper either. My mom had about a 10-year-old station wagon. And uh, two weeks later, I loaded that station wagon up, wagon up with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of art. My parents were flying in to, to help me um, uh, a couple days later. And I get to New York. I drive into the armory. And here are 90 of the biggest galleries in the world. They're from Paris and London and Munich and New York. And you get a little sign in front of your exhibition space. And mine said Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> at the end of the, it was a five day show. And at the end of the fifth day, I had sold more art than I'd ever sold before. I didn't realize people actually paid that much money for art. <laughs> and it ended at around 8 o'clock at night. And uh, I had to get back, to, back home that night because uh, my wife had to get back to work. And uh, my oldest son, I don't think Kevin, I don't think you were born, but my, my oldest son, I think, probably had a t-ball practice and I was the coach. <laughs> and uh, by about 11 o'clock, I had the car all packed up with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of art. I dressed in a Brooks Brothers suit had either Penny Loafers or Johnston Murphys on. And uh, I don't know New York at all. I asked the guards, you know, I said, how do I get uh, to the Lincoln Tunnel from here? And they said, well, you go out onto Park Avenue. You take a right on 34th Street. You'll see signs for the Lincoln Tunnel, which will take you into New Jersey, which will take you into Pennsylvania, which will take you to Ohio. So I pull out onto Park Avenue, Frank Sinatra singing New York, New York, and for five minutes I'm thinking, Michael, you are the greatest Japanese print dealer in the world. <laughs> and I take a right on 34th Street, and uh, I see the sign for the Lincoln Tunnel. And it was a time in New York where there was a lot of crime and there were a lot of murders, and, and uh, I'm thinking all I got to do is get out of New York now, and I've made it. About six seconds later, I hit this big metal grate in the road, and I hear the right front tire go flat. And uh, I pull over to the side. There are a couple homeless people leaning up against the building. It's about midnight. And I, I get out of the car really quick to look at the tire. I go, well, it's flat. And, uh, and uh, I get back in the car and lock all the doors because I'm scared. I'm a stupid guy from the Midwest. I see this guy walking down the street with his three-year-old and his one-year-old and his pregnant wife. Not a very wealthy looking guy. And I got out of the car, I said, excuse me, I said, there's not a gas station around here, is there? And the guy goes, nope. And I said, uh, should I call the police? He goes, nope, they won't come. <laughs> so I Bradley got tears in my eyes, and uh, I, I said, what should I do? And he says, well, he says, I'll help you. He says, where's the spare? I realized that the spare yeah. is underneath all the art. <laughs> so now all the art sitting on the streets of New York, if, and I try to get the lug nuts off, but they've been put on with those machine gun screwdrivers, and I'm jumping up and down with my penny loafers, and I can't budge them. And they, this guy's got heavy boots on. He says, he says, let me do it. He gets them loose really quickly. And uh, I said, okay, I'll jack the car up. So I start jacking the car up. I got it about three quarters of the way up, and all of a sudden the jack starts to fall over. So like an idiot, I put my hand underneath the body of the car like I was going to hold it up. And the car slams down. I look at my wrist, and this big, huge bump comes up, and I say, oh, my God, I just broke my wrist. And I, I'm starting to hyperventilate, have my hands over my face, and... And the, la the, la the lady, his wife says, uh, it's all right, Mike, it's all right, right, Mike? Is it all right if I call you Mike? I go, yeah, you can call me Mike. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, at this point, you revert back to like you're five years old. My parents were staying in New York a couple extra days. And this was before cell phones and everything. So I run across the street to the pay phone. And I've got all this money in my tens of thousands of dollars in my pocket, but I only have one quarter. <laughs> So I put the quarter in the, in the telephone booth, and my mom answers. I said, Mom, I'm the 34th and 6th. All the art's sitting on the street. 
<laughs> I got a flat tire and I think I broke my wrist. Will you please get here? <laughs> so I run back across the street and this guy says, I'll jack the car up. Because he realized that I was mechanically dysfunctional. So, so he starts jacking the car up and every time he jacks the car up, he goes, thank you, Jesus, thank you. And the whole family breaks out into this hymn. And he looks back at me, he says, uh, he says Michael, he says, uh, you got to thank Jesus. And uh, I, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm certainly not going to tell this guy I'm Jewish. And uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so I said, I'm thanking him. And I didn't know the words, so I just hummed along. And, uh, and so about two minutes before we got the, the stinky tire on, um, uh, my par uh, two minutes before m my parents got there, we got this little dinky tire on. And, I asked this guy, can I give you some money for helping me out? He was not a wealthy guy. And, uh, and he says, no, if I can't help somebody out, it's just not right. So I ended, ended up sending a print of the Good Samaritan by a Japanese artist to him, a Barbie doll for his daughter and a baby book. But this guy was um, from the Bronx, and he just happened to be walking in Manhattan that night. And his name was De Jesus. <laughs> Which brings us to why we're really here for the bedtime stories. <laughs> Each night before I'd go to sleep, my dad would tell me a bedtime story. These were wild stories full of imaginary figures who had to overcome extreme odds to make it in the world of good and bad. He would enter the room you turn off all the lights, you flare his teeth, <laughs> you bring a flashlight in to do these shadow puppets of, uh, of swans and rabbits and uh, wolves and alligators and there was always a witch. And you have to imagine what this all sounded like being five to eight years old. And each story began like this. Once upon a time. Once upon a time there were nine brownies, six red leg hot leg goldilockses, <laughs> three Kanish, and one Canadala. These these were called and by the way, these are called Kanish stories. These characters had to travel through the woods to achieve some impossible mission or dream. Does everybody know what a tookie is? That's your butt. And if you didn't achieve this, your tookie would fall off. <laughs> and uh, so as the story went on, your, your tookie got loose, looser. And, and uh, as you went further and further into the woods, and you had to go in search of the golden screwdriver, which would, you would, would insert your finger into your belly button to tighten your tookie. Um, and uh, there was lots of tickling and screaming, and, and uh, I, think my, I think my father knew that basically when we all walk out of the house, our, our tookies are a little loose. And, uh, so if you get nothing else out of this talk, you know, make sure you, you tighten your tookie before you leave. <laughs> My mother would scream from the hallway, go to sleep, sweet dreams. <laughs> My dad would peek. My dad would peek back into the room and uh, he'd point his finger at me and put his finger to his lip and he'd wink. And I'd wink back. At the end of each story, there was a moral to the story. There was, a, uh, there, was a, uh, there was either a moral to the story on how to be a good person, or how to make your dreams come true, or a lesson to be learned. This went on until I was about 25. <laughs> But seriously, I haven't slept in about 40 years. 
Are you still with me? <laughs> what is the Verne Gallery? It's a place that's unique in the world of art. It's a world of quiet elegance that only exists in this gallery. You cannot find this anywhere else in the world. It's a world of beautiful Japanese and prints and paintings that was established 65 years ago. It's a place where you can laugh. It's a place where you can share a story on a lonely day. It's a place where you can drink a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, drink a glass of wine or a beer. It's a place where you can say whatever you want with no fear. Where did these stories come from? They come from walking around the block with my dad in the 1960s and 70s with the family dog. They come from what my mom taught me about Japanese art. They come from sitting on my porch early in the morning drinking a cup of coffee, dreaming of being the best in the world. They come from reading the sports page in the shower, dreaming that Cleveland Indians will win the series. <laughs> They come from drinking a beer or a glass of wine with a friend in a local bar. They come from coaching my kids in Little League on a hot summer night, listening to their hopes and dreams. We're just about done. Why didn't I make the gallery bigger? One, my dad was probably the top dentist in the world. He had the smallest office. And uh, he didn't need anything that big. Growing up, my parents and their friends were sometimes evaluated by their professions and their social status. I'm sure when my parents told, my, told, told their friends, well, Michael, Michael's going to go work with Mitzi and make this a world-renowned gallery, they all were like, yeah, right. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I, I do that every morning, too. But, uh, but for me, my sons, Kevin and Brian are everything. From the time they were about five years old to their last pitch in college, I saw almost every game. I also coached quite a few of them until they were about 13. And that's what I'm most proud of. It was not only their, it was not only their dream come true, but mine too. So I ask you to all rise. If you can, if you can, stand up. Yeah. <laughs> so now you can see how, how powerful baseball art and preaching are. And I always wanted a standing ovation. <laughs> But, but seriously, I just wanted to see if everybody would do it. Now you can sit down and I'll finish this. And so, so. <laughs> I thought of that this morning while drinking my coffee. It's a, uh. All right, so that brings us to the conclusion. It's called Baseball Art and Preaching. This last part... This last part is mainly for my kids, for you, Brian and Kevin. But it's also for anyone who has hopes and dreams. So I say to you, Brian and Kevin, Kevin and Brian,
when you step to the plate. And as the pitcher winds up, swing for the fences. <laughs> and at the crack of the bat, as the ball sails out of the park. As the ball sails out of the park, look up to the sky. Raise your hands. <laughs> and as you circle the bases, point to the crowd. And as you cross home plate, whatever that plate may be for you or anybody here, and as you cross home plate, wink. <laughs> wink. And I'll wink back. And that's Sundays with Mike. Thank you. Yes? I'd like to add just one little note. Okay. To put a star on your forehead. Mm. Because, as many of you may know, I've been in the arts all my life and I have been in the arts around this country and other countries. And I walk into people's homes and they are amazed when I say, you bought that from Michael Burry. And I go, yes. <laughs> How did you know? Because Michael has such a wonderful eye and he's such a great support for artists that he's bringing joy and beauty into all these homes where I am able to say, you got that from my <laughs> <laughs> That's my sister. <laughs> 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 Thanks, everybody, and um, that's it. <laughs>